Hello everyone, I'm Pastor Dylan and welcome to the Dayspring Wesleyan Church Podcast. The best way to stay connected to the life of the church is downloading our app. Simply go to the App Store, search for Church Center, and download the app and enter the information for our church. This will connect you to our church community. I pray the following presentation will inspire you to come closer to God in this journey of faith. Enjoy listening. But anyways, um, Christmas, I love that. I, I love that time of year. And one of the reasons why, I, it just evokes um, so many emotions and just happy times. And I think there's things that um, stir your memory from time to time that uh, we're just not aware of. So um, Christmas does that. It, it, it sort of brings back a lot of memories of things that you experienced as a kid. You know, for me, a big thing was always opening up the gifts and being excited about getting those gifts that morning. Uh, now it's different for me. I love just watching my kids' excitement. I love being around the family. I love experiencing those, those type of things. Uh, we were over one of the days over at my dad's, and um, I think that uh, my parents got um, my niece Chloe a gift, and it stirred up all these emotions because it was a uh, record player. Now, I have to imagine, at first I was like, where am I? You know, because <laughs> I'm like, they're still making record players. I couldn't believe that, you know. But it, um, it brought back all these memories to mind when I saw that record player. It brought up, I remember my uh, parents, they, they always had uh, a record player, but the record player that Chloe got was about this big. The record players we had were like this big, you know what I mean? Because they had to have the, uh, the speakers with it and stuff. And then I always remember, especially at Christmas time, my mom, she would play uh, a lot of Christmas tunes, and that record player had that sort of a staticky type sound as it was playing. Uh, and she would often play, you know, the chipmunks singing, um, she would play White Christmas and some of those other, you know, just real familiar jingle bells and all that stuff. And, and uh, when I started thinking about and hearing those sounds, it brought up sort of the um, smells of like cookies and candies that would often be put on the table. It reminded me about the taste of like noodles is a tradition at our family around Christmas. And so there's that great taste of, of those noodles and ham and, and turkey and, and all that. Oh, I'm just getting hungry. I'm sorry. It's probably getting close to lunchtime for us. Um, and, then, uh, uh, and then there's just the, the sights of seeing everybody around the table, everybody smiling. Um, there's the stories that are shared over and over that you can't help but just sort of reflect on. And then there's the playing of games that we often do. And um, it's just such a joyous time of remembrance, you know. And then I also understand, though, that for everybody... You know, those memories aren't always the most joyous thing. Maybe something happened around Christmas or there wasn't enough provided for or maybe you didn't have as happy times. But those are still memories that we, that we wrestle with. But it's, it's weird because Christmas really includes all those, um, um, all those senses that we experience. And I think that's why communion is one of the most important things that we can do. Because communion, um, it takes in all those senses into account. There was something that we were talking about at the end of our study about finding Christ in the mess when we're talking about Mary. And if you remember, Mary is, has all these things that she's experiencing. It's the first child. It's the angels coming to her. It's um, people coming up and basically giving her prophecies and telling her that this is the Messiah, that this is God's child. And all these things are reaffirming everything that she's experiencing and feeling. She, um, she sits down with some relatives and uh, we read that John the Baptist jumps for joy at the mention of Mary being pregnant, and she gets to experience that. And at the end of everything she's experiencing, it says this, it says that Mary treasured these things in her heart. Like it created this memory or moment that Mary was able to hold on to and carry on throughout her life. So I think that memories are definitely important. That's why, honestly, for me, getting, getting that dog for my kids and seeing Um, the look on their face because if you know me I'm not really much of an animal person so it's way out of my line to even think about doing that but the joy that I saw on my kids faces I'm like we we just created a memory that'll stick with them forever when we're looking at this passage of scripture today what you need to understand is that Jesus makes a statement in this that we're going to read here in a moment it's a statement that we often have on the front of our communion tables it's a statement that you'll see in front of churches but Jesus says this do this in remembrance of me. There was something powerful about that moment that he wanted people, every time that they took communion or they took the Lord's Supper together, he wanted 
that to stick in their mind. He wanted them to carry away a memory. And again, I think that's why it's so important that we, we touch, uh, we taste, and we smell the bread and the juice. And we do this together recognizing what he did. It's why Christmas Eve services, uh, just so you know, I'm always going to do candle lighting as long as I'm the pastor. And I'm not going to use fake candles. All right, because I think there's something powerful about holding that candle in your hand about passing that candle one by one and sharing and us spreading the message to each other. There's something about smelling the smoke, about feeling the heat of that flame and the warmth that there is in there. Um, Of course, we've made it easier now because we have a protective covering, but as a kid, man, you also got wax on your finger that burned, you know, and you carry that out with you, but you had that memory of that service and the meaning of singing Silent Night as a congregation a cappella that just just fills your soul. But Jesus made this statement about the importance of remembering certain marks that are going on. He wanted his disciples to remember this moment. So let's read together in Luke chapter 22, um, verses 14 through 20. And I want you to know, I know as we're preparing this, we're gonna be looking at a couple of different avenues as we read this. So let's read this together and we'll get into that. Uh, so it says, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is being poured out for you. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for giving us memories and giving us the senses that help us to call things to memory. It's very often that we'll smell a certain smell or hear a certain sound, and our mind will go back to a certain time in life. There are all the times when I look at things like the altar or... Um, the church or the communion table or the cross that I am filled with these moments of being brought up in the church and how significant those moments were for me. I pray today, Father, as we recognize your grace and as we recognize that what you did at that table that day was of utmost importance for those disciples. But Lord, it's important for us even now in a world that we are living in. I pray that as we would go through your word, if there's anything that I would get wrong and the interpretation, I pray that you would clean it up in the ears of your people so that your voice is the one they hear today and not mine. In your name we pray, amen. So as we focus on this message today, as we look into this passage, I want you to notice there's kind of like three scenarios that are taking place that I think that Jesus is alluding to. There's this um, sort of a remembering of the past. There's also a remembering what's happening in the present. And then there's a memory that also goes into the future as well. And I think it's important for us to realize that because as we're closing out one year and as we're going into another, I think there's times that we focus on certain things that happened in the past and, okay, maybe things can be different now in the future. It's almost like you get a do-over sometimes. Now, listen, I'm not one that's big on resolutions, all right? And the reason is is because I don't want to lie and I'm not going to keep a lot of them, okay? So, But there is one resolution that I've chosen to make this year. And it may not matter to you, but it matters to me. And the one resolution that I've decided is this, is that I do a lot of my devotions when I'm reading the Bible. I actually do it on my phone. And uh, I've decided that this year that I want to make sure that I'm reading more from a, um, an actual book instead of my phone. Now, this may not make sense to you, but here's the reason why. As I told you, I was, I was filled with memories. One of the memories I was filled with is this. My mom read the Word of God every day, and I saw her do it physically in a book. I also saw the notes that she took down and penned. And my mom was so good at taking notes and that she would rewrite her notes and organize her notes and all this stuff. And she had all these questions in the Bible she'd write down. And then she also had another notepad of just prayer requests. And I would see my mom pray for me, my brothers, my family, and then people in the church as well. There was just a lot of things she had on there. I look back at that and I think, wow, what a wonderful memory I have that has been very evident in my life. Now, here's my fear for me. My fear is that my kids, when they see me on the phone reading my Bible, and again, this is just a personal thing, 
But when they see me, I don't know that they know that I'm reading the Bible or just looking at Facebook or something else. And I want them to have a memory of their dad who was in the word of God and who they saw either on his knees or in time of prayer, but that they see those moments because they can say at the end of the day, God was so important to my dad that he read from the word and he spent time in prayer. And so those are kind of things that I realized that were significant in my past that I want to put in my present so that it affects my kid's future. All right. So when we read this passage together, I love this because the first thing we're going to look at is remembering the past. And when we read Luke 22, 14 through 15, we begin to see that the Passover is the focus of it. And it says this, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So the first thing we learn is that the meal that Jesus was sharing with his disciples before he was to be crucified was this Passover meal. And the Passover meal for them was really a celebration. But what they were trying to understand and they knew because of their history that the Passover meal that they were celebrating together was freedom from slavery. And so the Passover meal was certainly important to the Jews of the time. Many Christians still practice it today. But each year, um, Jewish families would gather together with their family. They would take this meal together. It was called the Passover meal. And there was significant things that they did and remembered. And it was all to create these memorable moments and recognize what, what uh, God did for them. And if you remember, the Israelites were in bondage. They were in slavery to the Egyptians for a 400-year period of time. And in that moment, they began to cry out to God that they wanted to be set free from this slavery. And so then God eventually speaks to Moses in a burning bush. And he said, Moses, you're the guy that I'm calling. And here's what he says in Exodus 3, 7 through 10. He says, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their sufferings, so I come down to rescue them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. So this is the call that God has placed on the life of Moses. And Moses wasn't necessarily really thrilled about this idea. Matter of fact, he started making excuses and said, God, I don't speak well, so I'm not sure I'm the guy you should really be calling And God says, well, then you can use your brother Aaron. Let him be the voice. But I still want you to be the leader. And I need you to go to Pharaoh, which, again, is crazy because here he has to go with God's authority, which he trusts. But he has to go through the authority of man, which is Pharaoh. And God says, I want you to go to Pharaoh, and I want you to give him this message. And the message is this, let my people go. In other words, I want to free them from the bondage that they're in. Like they have been in slavery. They have been overworked. They have been underpaid. They have been really slaves to these people. They haven't had enough, and they need a place to call their own, and they need to be set free. And he said, I want you to go to them. Well, man, this was a huge task for Moses to do. So Moses went out there. He went to Pharaoh. He began to to, uh, say some things, and God said, look, I'm going to send some plagues along the way. I want you to go tell Pharaoh these plagues are coming. And as each plague came, it says this. It says that Pharaoh said, okay, look, Moses, take the people. And then as soon as Moses prayed that, that these things would be relieved, it says then, it says that Pharaoh rescinded. Like he, he said, no, 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 we're going to keep him here. And so he went, this is how thick-headed Pharaoh was. There was 10 different plagues before Pharaoh stayed with what he needed to stay with. And the final plague was what we know as sort of the Passover. Because what it said is this, the last plague was going to be God was going to send a destroying angel to take the lives of every firstborn in Egypt. Exodus 11.5 tells us this, from the firstborn son of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn son of the slave girl who is at her handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle as well. You see, God was trying to establish the difference between the gods of Egypt and the God of Israel, saying that I'm the one that's in charge. And Pharaoh, I said, let my people go. You keep rescinding the order. So now you're going to experience this last plague, which is going to be the the death of all the firstborn children. 
And for God, in order to make that distinction, he simply said this to Moses. I want you to tell the people to take a lamb that they own. I want them to raise it for four days. And at the end of that four days, I want them to sacrifice that lamb. I want them to take the blood, and I want them to put it on the sides of the door and on the top frame. And for those of you, this may not make sense, but it's really symbolic in that it's almost making the gesture of a cross. Blood here, blood here. And so that's very symbolic of what's going to happen in the future. So he tells them to take that blood. And then he says, then I want you to roast that meat. And then I want you to eat that meat. And I want you to take some herbs that are bitter. And I want you to eat those bitter herbs. And then he said, and not only do I want you to experience those things, but I want you to have unleavened bread. I want you to have bread without yeast. And then I want you to eat that as well. And that's going to be the meal. And if you put that blood, it's going to be by that blood that you will be saved. And so that night we read that in all of Egypt, they never heard so much crying because of all the firstborn children that died that day. But the people of God who had trusted in the blood of the lamb, they were saved. Pharaoh didn't wait till morning to call Moses in. He called him at night and says, just go. Get out of here. I want to see you again. And then we read from the story what happens as a result. The celebration of the Passover was this. It was that idea of freedom from slavery. God had made them a free people to go into their own land that they knew would be the promised land flowing with milk and honey at some point. Like That's where God was sending them. And because of that freedom from slavery, what they began to experience is they began to experience God like never before. Because what they experience is they experience deliverance. Exodus 12, 40, 14 through 20, talks about the annual Passover that was celebrated. And the people over and over again were told to celebrate this Passover meal, remembering God's deliverance. And the things that took place that day were of great importance to them. The cup was to represent really the blood that was spilled out. They took the herbs that were bitter and that bitterness was to remind them of the bitterness of slavery that they had experienced. And they were to have the unleavened bread. And the unleavened bread was important because they didn't have time to wait for the bread to rise like the way it needed to be because they needed to get out of there in a hurry. And so it was all prepared and these were all symbolic gestures of remembering God's deliverance. And church, the Passover became a wonderful time of celebration. Some Christians and even Jews still celebrate these meals together, remembering the deliverance of God. And I think that's important. Why? I think too many times that we just go through the motions of certain meals. I think even when we get together as a family, Like, it seems like we're in such a hurry to eat and get out of there. We don't enjoy, like, weddings as like we used to. We don't spend this great amount of time. It's like we're in such a hurry to just get on that we miss the reason for what we're doing. And my fear is this, church, even as we come to the table for communion today, I pray that we don't rush through it. I pray that we stand in front of the table and we recognize what God did in setting us free and giving us deliverance. And I pray that that's the way that we come to the table. You see, I think it's important that we have these moments of time where we remember some of the things in our past. Like if you and I were to talk about the things in our past, like it's overwhelming, it's heavy, isn't it? Because there are some things that we're just ashamed of. There are some things that we stepped into that we're not too proud of. I mean, if, even if I looked at this last year, there would be times I would look and say, boy, I, I wish I would have handled that differently with my kids. Or I, I wish I would have shown my life, my wife a little bit more love or respect this year. I wish I wouldn't have, have ignored things that she said or things that she did. Or, there's times in the church that I, I, I wish I would have spoken better or I wish I would have been more loving or I would have, wish I would have been more forgiving or more supportive of other people that are finding their way in the Lord. I, I wish I wouldn't have been so judgmental there are times that I look at, at people in such need and, and I said to myself, I, boy, I wish, I wish I could provide them more for their needs. And there is a lot of guilt that we experience. 
And there's a lot of things that we get sucked into. And you and I have to understand that we have been set free from our past. And we have been delivered by the hand of God. And it's what moves us into our next text. Because I think that some of the things that happened in the past, we need to leave there. And as we focus on them, that helps us to remember how God moved in the past and how he still moves in the present. But we need to remember the present as well. Because what was happening this is that as the disciples were remembering the past, Jesus was saying some things in that day that he said, I need you to do this in remembrance of me because here's some important things that are taking place right now that I need you to focus on and I need you to keep in mind. So when he gets this meal together with them, and we're going to jump forward and then we'll get back to some of the other verses. But in verses 19 through 20, it says, Jesus took the bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is being poured out for you. You see, the Passover meal pointed forward to Christ's death on the cross and deliverance from sin. Jesus, Jesus shared this Passover meal with them, but when he was saying, Remember, he was saying, Look, I want you to take everything in right now. And I don't think they fully got it. I think when they were eating that meal together, it was just a celebration. But then Jesus started making statements. He took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body that we've broken for you. And I'm not sure that they totally got it that day. And I'm not sure how the bread sounded when they broke it. But I know that if I break some bread, it doesn't necessarily have like this huge sound. Uh, Some of it, if it's a little bit um, crispier bread, will have a little bit of a crunch to it, almost like a cracker type sound. But it's not really that much of a sound. But I bet, I bet whatever sound that was made that day, I bet after they saw Jesus beat up and bloody on the cross, and after they saw his body broken, I bet the next time that they broke that bread, that that sound echoed in their ears. And it was a part of remembering what he did in that present moment. Church, how broken are you in this present moment? How tough are things getting in your life that you're stepping into that brokenness? What kind of regrets do you and I have that we wish we had a do-over or we wish that God could step in? You see, when God's body was broken for you and when his blood was shed for you it was done so that you and I could feel the freedom from sin just like the Passover was a deliverance from freedom of slavery there are some of us some of you who have been bound by sin you have the enemy constantly reminding you of your shortcomings You have the Emily constantly reminding you of your failures. And you are in bondage to those moments where the devil keeps bringing it up and keep bringing it up and keep bringing it up. Here's what you need to know. You need the sound of that bread being broken to echo into your ears. And you need to understand that God's body was broken for you. And what you and I get experience out of that is grace. And grace is the idea that you and I Receive something that we don't deserve. That moment that Jesus died on that cross was such a powerful moment. Because honestly, people, listen, it was was like if you sinned in the Old Testament times, if you sacrificed a lamb, like that was supposed to be the forgiveness of your sins. Now here's the thing, if you were wealthy, you could easily sin and could easily be forgiven underneath that tradition. And people were just going through the motions. It's like some of us come to the table. We come up here, we take the bread and we take the juice. And I don't think we fully understand. It's like my son who said to me one time, Dad, can I have another cup of the juice? It was so good. I'm like, you don't get it. Like I want you to understand that it's goodness that comes out of that. But I want you to understand the suffering that he went through for us. And when Jesus died on the cross, it was the once and for all. It wasn't like you and I had to keep sacrificing animals. It said, I'm taking your place. My body is going to be broken for you. And I keep thinking, why would somebody do that? And it's because he loves you. He values you. 
It says this, and this is what you need to understand about grace. The scripture tells us in, in John 17 that he didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved. You see, the enemy wants to keep you held down. He wants to keep you in that sin. He wants to keep you in those past and those mistakes and in that brokenness. That's where he wants to keep you. But you need to understand that grace is about Jesus being enough on the cross that when he died for you and he bled out, that that was enough. And so when you and I come to the table, man, we get a share in that suffering and we get to experience his grace because he has set us free from our sin. He said that this is my body that was given for you. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. There have been some things that you probably said, that you've probably done, probably more recently than not. And where the enemy wants to keep you under the weight of that, Jesus wants to say, I took all that weight, and I want you to know that you're forgiven, and you are redeemed. And I love that, because Jesus just doesn't leave us in our brokenness, but it's his grace that sustains us. And so just as we remember in this present that all those things that we're going through, that God is there for us. God also gives this thing about also remembering the future as well. Because I love this point. It says this, that there will come a day when you and I will have a wedding feast with the Lamb. Luke 22, 16 through 18 says this, For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. We already had the Passover meal in the Old Testament, which is a, a memory of the past. It's foreshadowing the Lord's Supper in the New Testament. But then we have Jesus experiencing life with his disciples in the New Testament, showing them how to live. But then he promises them again a day of a wedding feast. In Revelations 19, 6 through 9 says this, Hallelujah, for our Lord God already made reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the lamb has come and his bride has been made made herself ready. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the lamb. Think about that. The Lord not only wants you to enjoy him in the present, but he's preparing a place for you that is future bent as well. He wants you to celebrate that wedding feast together. And I'll tell you, I, I love doing weddings. But I get it. A lot of you, when you're in a, a wedding and you're sitting there, like the ceremony, you're probably like, let's wrap this thing up, you know? And what you're probably like me, like, I, I just can't wait to get to the food, all right? I just want to get to the feast. Now, I want to tell you one of my pet peeves right now, okay? And I'm sorry if you disagree with this. I, I just want to let you know. Like, when they take pictures afterwards, like, you just need to let the people eat, all right? Like, don't make them wait, all right? Just let them eat because we're, we're all hungry. You know, we already sat through the wedding, you know what I mean? And you're making us sit and wait through pictures. Come on now, you know? So let us eat. We need that, okay? And by the way, you as the bride and groom aren't going to eat much anyways because you got to go say hi to everybody, okay? So let's keep everybody happy and let's just eat right. But the meal, man, is, is that great thing. And, and Jesus says this, that I'm preparing a meal for you, that you're going to sit down and eat with me. And what you have to understand, when you and I experience that last great meal together, what I want you to know is this, is that's freedom from sadness. And there's a lot of things in this world that just make me extremely sad. There's some diseases that people have experienced in this life. Maybe some of you are even experiencing some of, the, some of that. We're not talking to you later this morning. It says, I just had cancer over and over again. And she's experiencing that pain of cancer. There are some of you that experience the pain of, uh, of debt. There's those of you who experience the pain of, uh, of, of hoping your kids are raised right. There's the pain of you having someone that you loved in your life tell, tell you that I don't love you anymore. Like you've experienced those pains. And with those pains come great sadness. Whenever you lose somebody, that is great sadness. But there will come a day when we will sit with Jesus and we will be free from that sadness. It says there will be no more tears. There will be no more pain. There will be no more sorrow. Like we're going to experience Jesus face to face 
And we get to live in that moment. And it says that he will set us free. Revelation 19, 7 says, let us rejoice and be glad and give him the glory. Jesus is going to set this feast before you. And you and I, like, we're going to eat at that table. And here's the good news. I'm not going to have to worry about diabetes. All right? I can just eat and eat and be in the presence of God. And it's going to be a wonderful place. And some of you have experienced some of life's hard, sad truths. But he wants to give you freedom from that sadness. And the cool thing is, once he gives us that freedom from sadness, and again, the world we're living in right now is becoming sadder and sadder. And I, I'm, not, I'm not one that talks a lot about politics because I don't know it, but a decision that was made this week is bad news. It's a messed up thing. And as this world keeps getting farther and farther away from God, I pray that he returns quickly. Because I don't know what's going to happen to our nation. And there's a lot of this stuff that I just want to be done with. And this is what I love about Revelations. Because in Revelations, we're told, and this too will pass. But here's the other part of Revelation. Revelation talks about a lot of things that are going to go real crazy. And then we're going to see God establish his kingdom. And that's the day that I'm waiting for. I stand in his presence because this is what I know when I find freedom from sadness what I'm going to experience at the end of the time is God's design and God's design was what from the beginning of time when he made creation it was to have relationship or fellowship with his people it was to commune with them and that's why when we take the Lord's Supper together we call it communion because we're communing with God we're establishing a relationship with God when God set up this world, he didn't, have, he didn't have these plans for man to work it and to, to suffer pain and disease and death. He didn't have any of that on his mind. But when man allowed sin to come into the world, then Jesus, God, started making a redemptive plan for us so that you and I could stand under grace. And God is preparing a place for us that has no more sadness and it's going to be a place that he had planned for us from the beginning of time. And you and I get to sit in his presence throughout eternity, realizing the hope of what he said. The God that was faithful in the past, that showed himself in the present, is the same God that will be faithful into the future as we come into his glory and we get to stay with him. Church, today, as we celebrate the Lord's Supper together, I pray that you and I will be a people that will be changed and that you and I, when we take this bread and we take this juice together, that we will remember the sacrifice that he made. And we wouldn't just go through this haphazardly, but we'd experience it together. Thanks again for listening. If you are located in the Marion area, we would love to have you join us at one of our Sunday morning gatherings. For directions, service times, and information about our fantastic children and student ministries, please visit us at dayspringwesleyan.org. That's dayspringwesleyan.org.